creations, uh, the Atos and GIZ, and of course, Foundation Descubreme. Do you know that today you will learn the secret of why 90% of startups fail and what to do to become one of the 10% that will successfully flourish? And to make sure that you will get all of that exciting information, make sure you have the correct translation on because you can choose from our interpretation Spanish. So you will have everything in Spanish or you can choose the interpretation in French, which is really our international sign interpretation. So you can have that little man pinned and see how he's signing all of that we are saying. And I'm Margaret Grobelna from the Zero Project, and I'm joined here by the one and only Dr. Anthony Giannamos, that I surely butcher his last name as always, but I have the great pleasure to hand it over to him so he, he can share his knowledge and know-how that he's also bringing as inclusive creation a leader to the Scaling Solution Program. Anthony, the metaphorical floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Margaret. That is such an amazing introduction. And I'll just remind everybody as you're still popping into this uh, webinar that if you want Spanish language translation, go down to your menu, hit interpretation and select Spanish. And if you would like uh, international sign language, uh, go down to that interpretation menu again and select French. The international sign language is, is under the French interpretation listing. We have our captioning on. So if anybody just wants captions, you can pop those on at any minute. And please do, if you would like to pin the uh, international sign language interpreter to the uh, screen so that they show up there alongside me and all of the wonderful content that we're about to get into. So let us begin. So today we're going to jump into this whole reasons why social enterprises fail. So we called this webinar KPI don't care because a lot of enterprises get stuck on this issue of measuring our impact. And it can seem frustrating and a little bit annoying to have to always keep track of and try to figure out how to measure all the little things we do day to day. As somebody who's opened many, many social enterprises in his life, all I want to do is the important work, the impact work. I don't want to be bogged down with, oh, did we do this with this and this with this? And how much can we measure that? It's just too much a lot of times for me to think about when I have all these other important things in my mind. But I'm going to tell you the three reasons why you should actually care about KPIs, how we measure our key performance indicators. So today we're going to do top three reasons why social enterprises fail and what KPIs have to do with them. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how Zero Project Scaling Solutions is a program that has helped 12 social enterprises avoid failure and reach new markets around the world. It's a very exciting program that I'm hoping to give you a little bit more detail on. I also want to let you guys know, everyone, uh, the Q&A Q is open. So if I see you pop a question into the uh, into the question and answer, I will respond to it. So please do throw any questions that you might have into that Q&A. And of course, if you'd like to use the chat, you're welcome to use the chat as well. We'll be popping a lot of important information in the chat along the way. So let us see where we go. Yes, so five things experts do to showcase their company's value is our first webinar. So we ran this webinar a couple of weeks ago. And it was really exciting because it gave us a chance to kind of establish the framework for social enterprises and what it means to showcase value. Today, we're moving into the next stage, which is all about measuring that value. And if you want to watch the recording of this webinar, it will be available publicly in May when we release all four recordings of our four public webinars that we're going to be hosting. And just so you know, where's a preview here, our next webinar, which is going to be held here on April 9th uh, at 1400 CET, is going to be the number one thing you can do to maximize your impact. And what every social entrepreneur wants to know, how can I get funding? Will someone support me? Give me the resources I need to do the impactful work that I care about. So mark your calendars, April 9th. 
1400 for that next webinar. Now, I'm sure you're like me and you often sit there wondering why social enterprises fail. What is the causes behind all of these enterprises that are doing such good work, such impactful work, such meaningful work? And then we see them maybe for a year or so, and then they just go and they they just end, they end their, their, their work. Um, there's been some research on this. The Nest Impact Investing Group did a study in 2019 that showed one of the major reasons why social enterprises fail is because of lack of advanced management skills. Now, let's be clear. What does advanced management skills mean? It means that you have to be able to do more to run your enterprise than care about your social mission. Your social mission is incredibly important. We're going to talk a lot today about how we juxtapose our social mission in relation to our economic sustainability over the long term. But that advanced level management skills, how to manage a company, is often lacking in social enterprises. A lot of us get into social enterprises because we have a mission in the core of who we are, in our hearts and in our souls. There's things we want to achieve in the world. We want to try to leave the world a better place. But then we struggle to actually get down to the brass tacks of what it is to run a business. Number two, Nest Impact Investing study in 2019 also showed that social, social enterprises have mismatched financial goals and the skills to achieve them. And again, this comes up on the same issue of how do we juxtapose our social mission in relation to the business that we are running. So we might have big dreams of making money to continue our impact. We could be a nonprofit or a for-profit or somewhere in between. But those financial goals may not be fully aligned with the skills of the people that you have in-house. And that's a challenge because a lot of businesses that come out in the for-profit market that don't have necessarily the social impact at the core of what it is to be a social enterprise will have those skill sets embedded in their team. But as a social enterprise, a lot of times we're surrounded by people who think like us, who have the same mission as us, who have the same value systems as us. And we forget that there's a lot of business skills out there that we and our team may not have. And we might have projections going into five years in the future about how our finances are going to ensure that we're sustainable long term and we can grow, create more impact. But if we don't have the skills in-house, if we don't have the skills within our team, then there's a big mismatch in what we want to do what we aim to do, and what we can do. And the third uh, really important statistics here that I think you need to understand is uh, comes from a 2012 Harvard Business Review uh, called A New Approach to Funding Social Enterprises. Excellent article, which I would highly recommend you check it out. But social enterprises struggle to demonstrate value to investors and donors. And that's what today is all about. We're all about trying to showcase how we can create value for our community and for our economies so that investors and donors will see us as a viable prospect to put in their resources, whether that's money, time, energy, or anything else. So my name is Dr. Anthony Giannoumis. I'm a motivational speaker, workshop facilitator, and a course instructor, all focused in on this issue of inclusive leadership, which is part of my new book, The Sins and Wins of Inclusive Leadership. And I'm here today to talk to you about the number one things that you can be doing to think about how you can avoid failure in your business. Um, I think we all get the basic premise that measuring impact is essential for us to be able to move our business forward, to be able to see where we've come from, and to really attract that interest from investors. I think we also, a lot of us understand that uh, measuring our, our impact is about showcasing our efficacy so how good are we at doing what we are doing? Funders and investors are especially going to look at you in relationship to other pieces of work that are also trying to create impact. And a lot of them are trying to look at different groups of people across different industries and in different areas. And so then they're saying, okay, well, this group is trying to impact the lives of people with disabilities, but this group is trying to impact the lives of women and girls in, in the rural areas. So do I put my money into group A or group B? You've got to be able to showcase your efficacy in relation to the other groups of, uh, of social enterprises that are out there. And of course, a lot of us understand the basic need to measure so that we can understand how we can improve 
If we know where we've come from, we know where we can, where we are and where we can go to. But improving is based on our ability to measure where we've been. But I think a lot of us miss the fact that being able to measure our impact, being able to measure our growth, being able to measure our efficacy can be the life or death of your initiative. It can be the difference between your work ending unceremoniously or continuing in the long, long term. And I think all of us are into social enterprises and social impact initiatives because we want to see them grow and continue to, uh, to create impact. If we, we can manage to achieve this, if we can manage to find ways of measuring our impact and showcasing the value that we have for the different stakeholders that are out there, it will minimize the risk that an investor or a funder just completely overlooks your initiative. Again, if they're looking at a portfolio of 10, 15, 20, maybe even 100 different initiatives, they've got to be able to discern what's working, what's not very, very quickly. And to be overlooked because you weren't able to showcase that value, that you weren't able to showcase the impact in tangible numbers means that they're going to miss out on an opportunity to do really good work. It'll also help you maintain the engagement of your customers, clients, and stakeholders, being able to put out numbers and say, hey, look, this is what we are able to achieve. This is the impact, measurable impact we can show. Keeps people interested in what you're doing, whether that's a supplier or a benefactor or just someone who's got a really, uh, really a high stake in what we are doing, a high degree of interest in what we are doing. It also helps us maximize any opportunities we have to scale into new markets, whether that's local, within our country, regional, within neighboring countries, or internationally, within countries around the world. Now, you might be saying, Anthony, fine, but measuring impact, and I, I had this, this has been my narrative in my head for the last 15 years of running companies, measuring impact is, takes so much time and effort. And you're absolutely right. That's the voice in my head almost every day that I wake up. Oh my gosh, do I have to measure this stuff? It's so much energy. You're absolutely right. It is a lot of energy. And in fact, it's, the, it's because it takes a lot of energy and effort that makes it so important for us to do. Because when we're investing our time, we're investing our energy into understanding the nuances of what we're trying to achieve, it will help us so much show what it is the value of the impact that we're creating. So we're gonna start off with these KPI don't care, top three reasons why social enterprises fail. Then we're gonna jump into a little bit about the zero project scaling solutions and how that's helped 12 social enterprises avoid failure. So the number one thing that I think a lot of social enterprises struggle with is this clash between the mission and the money. A few years ago, I was invited to join the board of directors for a company called Humans for Humans. And Humans for Humans is run by a very dynamic and amazing, amazingly strong and tenacious woman who is just fully invested in who she is into the business that she has created. And Humans for Humans is dedicated to her mission, her personal mission, to raise awareness around uh, human trafficking and human trafficking issues. So she works to combat human trafficking on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, if you wanna talk about someone who cares about the mission almost more than anything else in her life, this is the founder of Humans for Humans. It's that level of passion and uh, intense focus on that mission. And when I, she first approached me, she approached me because she wanted to understand a little bit more about how to make her social enterprise sustainable long term. Because, of course, with something like human trafficking, there's a lot of ethical issues with how money starts to get involved. There's a lot of ethical issues with how we take human trafficking issues and find ways of creating economic sustainability. And at first, I looked at her business model, and I said, I just don't know that there's any way we can create a social enterprise about out of this, because her focus was exclusively on providing psychiatric care 
for uh, for human trafficking survivors, for providing uh, raising awareness through social media and podcasts and things like that, through creating events to raise awareness around issues around uh, uh, human trafficking. And so at first glance, I was like, there's just not a business model here. This is something that's going to have to just be your mission. And you're always going to be struggling to bring in enough resources to keep this thing going. And so there was this issue where in her work, her mission had completely overtaken any thought about how we can make our business economically sustainable. And so at as I continue to work with the board and continue to think creatively about how we can monetize some of the things that we are doing, we begin to introduce new ways of thinking about our work. And so we stopped thinking of it exclusively as nonprofit focused only on the mission and started thinking about how we can package different trainings, different awareness raising initiatives that would enable us to make money and to fund all of the nonprofit work that we were doing. So there was this tenuous balance between me and the other members of the board of directors as we would negotiate what we wanted to do in the coming year. Because of course, a lot of the folks like the founder want to focus in on the mission issues. And then you have someone like me saying, no, we do have to also pay attention to these monetary and financial issues because if we don't, we're never gonna survive. As passionate as she is, we all face issues around burnout. We all face issues around our own financial stability. So it's not an option to just work for free forever, no matter how much you care about that mission. Eventually, you have to start thinking about money, the revenue your enterprise is taking in, and how that's going to work in the long term in, in what you want to do. And so we had to balance this, uh, this, uh, this back and forth between whether or not we focus on the mission and how much we focus on the money and in what ways we can focus ethically on the money and in what ways we can do it without sacrificing our mission. And it was a constant struggle of debate back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And I'll, I'm proud to say that we never let money overtake our mission. But there is that need to make sure that we are finding a balance between the money and the mission. And what that gives us isn't just sustainability in the social sense and our ability to create that impact and hopefully create that impact long term. It gives us sustainability as an enterprise financially so that we know in three years, in five years, maybe even seven or 10 years, we're still going to be around. And I think it's easy for a lot of social enterprises to point to organizations that have been around forever and say, oh, well, they figured out how to do it. I'll just do it like them. But the world is massively different from the time when organizations like Plan International came about or the Red Cross or uh, uh, Medicine Sans Frontiers, Doctors Without Borders. The world is an entirely different place. And social enterprises' role in the economy and in society is entirely different than what it was uh, when I was a kid back in the early 1980s and 1990s. And so we have to think differently about how we're running our social enterprises. And that starts with finding a good balance between our financial and our social sustainability, the initiatives that we're going to do within our organization. Just a reminder here, if any of the attendees want to ask questions, pop them into the Q&A. And if you're able to pop any chat messages into the chat, I see Ragant has been putting lots of really exciting messages there to everyone in the in the in the webinar all right so number two reason social enterprises fail is because the market is a complete mystery to them so i'll bring another case story into this discussion and that is one of my companies that i ran called sare innovation our whole aim was to make innovation accessible for as many people as possible. So the process and act of innovating, we wanted to make it easy to understand, easy to learn, and easy to do. And so what we thought our market was, was basically everyone. We were thinking, oh, parents would love it, children would love it, schools would love it, kindergartens would love it, teachers would love it, and so on and so on. We thought our market was just everyone. And we didn't really think critically about where we wanted to start, we didn't really think critically about how narrow the scope is that we could uh, that we could focus in on, how narrow, narrow our target is. 
And so we just kind of went with wherever the need was and we would bounce around and around and around and around. We would ask people and talk to experts and look at it. Okay, maybe this group would be the one we targeted. This group would be the one we target. And in a lot of the work that we've done in scaling solutions has been with organizations uh, representing people with disabilities or social enterprises that have disability issues at the core of their business models and their work. And in this space, we know that the needs are many. The needs are vast. We will never run out of problems that we can solve in this area. And so it's been difficult running a business, running Sarah Innovation, looking at the different business models that I've worked with to see so much need, but being but seeing also the demand for us to focus in on a specific group. And of course, as we talked, whenever we were working in Sarah Innovation, as we talked to more and more advisors, they were looking at us and they were bouncing between there's just too much. And then the other side of the coin, your market is far too small. So at one point in time, we were looking only at elementary schools in the Oslo region. And while there are several elementary schools in Oslo, Norway, there's not so many that you could make a business out of it. And so investors and funders are a lot of times going to probe you and you're going to have to answer to the fact, is your market too large? Oh gosh, going wrong direction here, let's go back. Is your market too large? Are there too many needs out there? Are you trying to fulfill too many to solve too many problems, or is your market too small? Have you focused in and narrowed too much where now I don't see a viable market that you could uh, that you could uh, work with, that you could um, that you could meet the needs of? And I think in disability issues, it's especially relevant because a lot of time on the local scale, we're working with a very small group of people. If you work within a school, for example, a lot of times the number of people with disabilities can seem to maybe a school administrator or a funder, it could maybe seem almost insignificant, even though in the lives of those people with disabilities, it may be extremely important, whatever initiative you have, may be extremely important for them to be able to participate in the classroom, to participate in education, but to someone at a higher level, they might see that as, okay, this is a drop in the bucket. So you've got to be able to articulate where is your market? Is it in that school? Is it in that region? And how are you going to reach those individuals? You have to be able to articulate clearly the parameters to your, your focus. And so it's easy for us uh, a lot of times in disability areas to just lean on the global population of people with disabilities. And I, I'm guilty as anybody throwing out numbers like a, you know the market for inclusively designed products and services is like 13 million euro worldwide. And it's a great number to throw out there if you're just trying to get people interested in what you're doing. But an investor and a funder is going to want to know a lot more specifically, who are you targeting? And do you see them as a viable market? And how can you showcase the economic value of that market? And then all wrapped up into this issue of marketing is understanding your competition. And in this social enterprise space, competition is incredibly complicated. A lot of the times, because you might be the only service that's out there doing what you do. And especially if it's on a local scale, you're probably the only service bar none. And that can be tough to then articulate what is the competition like. And so for my enterprise, the Zara Innovation, what we came up with was a card game that children could play with each other that would teach them about innovation. And so when we thought about our competition, it was really tough to kind of figure out, okay, is our competition other card games? It doesn't seem like it. Is our competition like a school book or a lecture? Is that the alternative in school of learning playing games versus learning just traditionally? No, we really had a hard time to articulate what our competition was. Is our competition Netflix? I mean, when the kids go home, are they gonna watch Netflix over playing our card game? We didn't know. We didn't know how to articulate our competition well. So as a social enterprise, you gotta be able to think really critically about these issues and understand what does our competition look like? What are the substitutes that are out there for what we're doing? And if you come up with nothing, then that's even a, more of a problem for a funder and investor because they're gonna ask, but why has nobody else done this? And you've gotta be able to answer to that very, very clearly. 
The third key issue here why a lot of uh, social enterprises fail is cash crunch. I don't know, I don't care how many social enterprises I talk to, almost every one of them, when I ask them, what do you need? The first thing out of their mouth is we need money. We need money. We will not survive till next year, next month, next week, if we don't get money. And it's because a lot of them are surviving off of cash grants from government or some philanthrop philanthropic organizations. They haven't figured out quite yet how to generate those different lines of revenue. And even in my company, the one I run now, Inclusive Creation, it can be a real challenge to think about our financial situation in relation to our social mission. And it wasn't even last year, we were in a position where we didn't know if we were going to last the rest of the year. And so it's really tough as a social enterprise, because you're constantly having to try to think, can we make it to the next month's payroll? Can we make it to the next year's uh, 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 sustainability? How can we make it to the next year? Ooh, clicker is clicking too much. Here we go. And so you, I, I think as a social enterprise, you have to ask yourself, do investors, do funders even care about our impact? Do, do they more care about our financial situation than our impact? And the answer to that is yes and no. Ultimately, what an what a impact investor will want to look for is that first thing. Are you able to make an impact? And if so, can you do it in a way that's economically sustainable? So when I was first starting to run my business, I knew we could create an impact doing speeches and raising awareness and doing workshops and running courses, but I didn't know if we could make money off of it. I had no idea. I didn't even know how to make money off of these things. I had friends and colleagues who were doing similar work, not in impact work, but they were doing similar work that they would say, oh, we, we've got all this. They give us all this money. These corporate co companies give us all this money to do this work. And then I'm sitting there looking at it, I'm like, but nobody, no, I don't, that, doesn't, that doesn't hit me in the same way it's hit you. And so I had to think critically, okay, what would an investor be looking at if they were looking at my company? Are they exclusively going to look at that impact issue? Or are they going to be looking at finances too? So being able to measure both your impact and your finances is absolutely critical here. And then you have to start asking yourself, do you want to go for profit or nonprofit or somewhere in between? My company started out as a for-profit. We're continuing as a for-profit, but there's been many times we've thought about pivoting into a nonprofit model because we said, we don't know if it's even worth us be being a for-profit enterprise. And that's something you ought to reflect on and ask yourself. Is there a social mission that mandates a nonprofit status? And in so doing, are there benefits to being nonprofit? Does this open up new avenues of funding? Does this op open up new avenues of support that we wouldn't get if we were for profit? And then when you're thinking about whether or not to be for profit, what opportunities are you going to get being a for profit company that you may not get as a nonprofit? Number one, if you're seeking to attract investors, they're probably not going to be in interested in a nonprofit company because that's not going to generate returns for them. But if you got a good, strong for-profit model that's actually going to generate profit, then you might have a, an opportunity to attract an investor. And then what does the in-between look like? Well, maybe you have a for-profit company that provides enough revenue and income to support that nonprofit arm. And that's the kind of direction I'm going with my company now. We're in the process of rolling out a nonprofit arm that will be uh, uh, subsidized by the for-profit enterprise. So that we can still do the impact work we care about, but we can do it in a way that's economically sustainable in the long term. And then you've got this issue of profit and how as a social enterprise do we deal with profit? And I think a lot of folks kind of suffer under the illusion that if you're, if you're a nonprofit or if you're a social enterprise, then you shouldn't be even concerned with a profit margin, for example. And uh, I think this is a fallacy. I think this is, a, this is a, an error because as a social enterprise, you should be concerned with how much revenue you're generating for whatever it is you're doing, product, service, initiative, and then how much does it cost to do that? And I think you should be brave in making sure that your margins, your margins of profit are, are good enough 
that you will be economically sustain, uh, sustainable in the long term. And that doesn't mean that you're going to pay out money to investors necessarily. What it means is that you're going to take that profit and reinvest it in the company. Pay yourself and your team a good salary so that you feel comfortable continuing to champion this work. So understanding your profit margin is absolutely critical to the longer term sustainability of your, uh, of your initiative, of your social enterprise. So the lesson here is that KPIs can be incredibly boring and annoying to have to track, but you don't want to fail as a business. And therefore, it makes measuring your KPIs absolutely integral because investors and funders are going to care about your KPIs. You may not, but your investors and funders will care deeply because, again, they're looking at a portfolio of projects, initiatives, other businesses that all are claiming incredible impact. And they're going to have to stack up yours versus theirs and decide who do we want to put our resources behind. And if you can show measurable impact, we've done X in a way that's Y so that people feel Z, people, the investors and funders will care about your work. They will turn on to it. And measuring your impact is also about replicability. It means that if you have an initiative that's happening on a local scale, being able to measure that impact will help you understand better what to expect if you want to branch out and recreate what you've done, what you've achieved, if you want to replicate it in other regions, areas, or places around the globe. And that brings us to, oops, the Zero Project Scaling Solutions Program, which is a brand new initiative who's done incredible work already in our first year and we were very excited to run a second year of this program starting up in the next couple of months. The Scaling Solutions Program is brought to you by the Essel Foundation, Fundacion de Scuberme, ATOS, GIZ, and BMZ, and Inclusive Creation, my company. And it's all based on this issue of finding ways of preventing uh, the failure rate of social enterprises. So what Margaret said at the beginning was spot on. 90% of new startups fail. That means if you're running a social enterprise and you're in the first three years of your operations, there's a 90% chance you won't make it to your fourth year. And that's called the valley of death. And what happens during this valley of death is that an enterprise will come up with a brilliant idea that they think is really, really good and is going to create a lot of impact. And then they try it out and they start working with it. And then in the process of commercializing, in the process of trying to generate revenue, they hit a slump. And that's when a lot of these organizations just drop out of the market completely. And so the whole point of the Scaling Solutions Program is to help us bridge that gap. And we think the cause of this high failure rate is that there's just not enough guidance to support. This is the conventional wisdom. If we just provide enough guidance and support, it'll fix all the problems. What we at Scaling Solutions believe the actual cause is, is that founders, the people who are at the heart of those organizations, the people who are running Humans for Humans and Sarah Innovation and my company, we eventually just stop. We eventually just give up hope because we don't think that we can keep this thing going. And so the solution we've come up with in, in Scaling Solutions, the Scaling solution solution is to number one, develop the person and number two, develop the business. So we're not just exclusively focused on the business, we're also focused in on the founders who are supporting those businesses. And again, this is brought to you by uh, the support from uh, Essel Foundation, Fundacion de Scuberme, ATOS, GIZ, and BMZ, and uh, Inclusive Creation. Part of my team at Inclusive Creation includes Regant Arnori, who is just an incredible powerhouse of a human being. He is on the call today. He's helped organize everything and make this webinar what it is. And then we have our behind-the-scenes guru, Anne Eagle Tjern, she was one of my former students and went and co-founded a business with her. And uh, now she is taking care of all of the back office stuff, making sure the business as a whole is strong. She's the one to remind me of these issues around KPIs and how we measure our performance as a, uh, as a business. Now, I think a lot of us understand that disability innovations are really critical to our societal growth. You don't have to look very far to see examples of innovations that were originally conceived for people with disabilities that later became part of everyone's repertoire. So a piece of an innovation that started at life 
as something focused in on a person with disability. And suddenly everybody decided that actually works really well for me too. So we can look at things like the keyboard and the typewriter originally built for someone who couldn't hold a quill pen. We can look at things like speech to text. So every time we speak into a smart speaker or into our phone's voice assistant, this technology was developed originally for persons with, persons with disabilities and then later became adopted by the broader public. Audiobooks are another perfect example, developed originally for people with disabilities and later became adopted by everyone. And so these are the kinds of ideas we focus in on in scaling solutions. I think a lot of us also understand the need for social enterprises to commercialize and scale. This is what gets you from the starting point to over that valley of death. And that includes understanding your market opportunities. We talked a lot about that earlier, understanding how to operate and execute the vision of your organization and business as leaders, how to grow and expand that company, and how to really anchor your business model in not only social, but also economic, financial sustainability. And so we've developed a custom program. We see that there was a need for a customized program that wasn't just a one size fits all for any businesses that are out there, but really focused in on the needs of people who are championing disability innovations. So we looked at this issue of how we can personalize, empower, create insights and customize the program for those individuals. And so we occupy a really unique position in the market because we combine four really important spheres in disability innovation. We combine the advocacy portion. I don't think anybody gets into social enterprises focused in on disability issues without some fire for advocacy, some desire to advocate with and for persons with disabilities. And I think a lot of people also want to share the knowledge that they've come up with. They've created something really cool. They want to share it with the world. And the other thing the Hero Project Scaling Solutions gets into is the research. So what is the science that will help enable these companies, these organizations to thrive? And then innovation being at the core of it, how can we take these new ideas and bring them to new places in the market? And so what Scaling Solutions has found are ways in which we can bridge this failure to this valley of, valley of death, this gap in the, in, the, in the success rate. And the program is, uh, has been shown to maintain the momentum of these initiatives. It helps keep them going and helps maximize their impact. Now, you might be thinking, Anthony, hold on. Scaling solutions seems like a hell of a lot of effort. I don't know if I can handle all this. I already got a thousand things pulling me a thousand different ways. I don't think I can handle another program. Well, I got good news for you. Our program is built on expertise. It's been created by startups. It's been validated by experts to work really, really well when you're in that high growth stage, that pre-funding, almost getting there, and then boom, you're going to catapult into a new, uh, a new place in your business development. And it's because we are founder-centric. We care about the lived experiences and especially the lived experiences of people with disabilities. We care about incentives. So the whole program is oriented around rewards and giveaways so that the people who are participating, our Scaling Solutions fellows, are able to get some value out of it besides just a bunch of talk from people like me. And then we have a really strong system of mentorship and reverse mentorship. So coming into the program, you're going to get someone who is there almost as a concierge to help you and support you along your journey. And then, of course, there's a ton of peer and alumni support within the cohort and within the previous cohorts that we've already run. Scaling Solutions is also business-centric. So we really care and we find ways of supporting your go-to-market strategies, tech support, business, uh, product development, things like that, so that you know what you need to do to take your work to the next level. We really care about giving you tools. This is not a university course. This is hands-on business development. This is hands-on scaling so that you're not going to just get a whole bunch of theory, 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 theory. You're going to be working with real life practitioners who do this sort of thing every day, all day. And then number three, again, something that almost every social enterprise cares about, where am I going to get the money? So we work with you to help you find and secure funding and provide legal advice where you need it. Our, our uh, Scaling Solutions program is also network-centric. 
We have a vast array. I think in scaling solutions, you are only one or two persons removed from literally everyone on this planet. I don't care how famous the celebrity or how humble the origins of the person. I think we are only one or two persons removed from those, from everyone. And it's because we've united forces with the German government. So GIZ and BMZ, we've united forces with ATOS, a very large tech corporation. We've united forces with Fundacion Descubreme, which I think has the entire Latin America region connected. And we have joined forces with the Zero Project. If you're not familiar with them, they have created absolutely phenomenal impact with their Zero Project Conference and their other initiatives that they launch on a regular basis. And then we are also working with Enable India to help us connect our fellows and to help connect the fellows in India to different markets. And if you're not, if you don't know anything about the India market, you should definitely be looking into that because internationally, globally, that's one of the markets that has the most promise in the future. And it's especially when we're talking about disability innovations. We have the whole program oriented around three key things, and you'll recognize the first one right off the bat, metrics-driven value enhancement. So the whole point of today's session was KPIs, how do we measure our value and our impact? Metrics-driven value enhancement is where we're at. Our program is also oriented to connectivity for sustainable growth. What that means is we do everything we can to connect you to the right people so that your organization can grow regionally, nationally, internationally. And we also work with you to focus in on issues around external relations and strategic alliances, really connecting you to the key people who can take your business to the next level. We also have a mantra in Scaling Solutions. We like to have this as our kind of guidelines to help us, help remind us why we're doing what we're doing and help get us through the times that may be troubling. And so I wanna take you through that mantra right here, right now. And our mantra starts with, it's gonna be messy. The process of being an entrepreneur, of running a company is a messy one. But we trust the process because we know Scaling Solutions has been validated by experts and it's been uh, it's been uh, advised by the startup community. Number two, we work on our relationships first and everything else second. Your product development is probably really, really, really important. And you might be in a stage of your product development where you're at a critical juncture, but that should never overshadow the relationships you have with your team and with any of your external stakeholders. Relationships always come first in, so in scaling solutions. Number three, and this gets into a little bit of soft skills, but I love soft skills. I think of soft skills as power skills. We have to feel our feelings. We have to be empath empathic to ourselves and be kind to ourselves so that we as entrepreneurs are whole and strong so that we can continue our work on a daily basis. Because if anything can be mentally, physically, and emotionally draining, it's social impact work. It's so incredibly important and all of us take it so incredibly seriously that there are going to be times where you're struggling and feeling your feelings, being kind to yourself is incredibly important for making uh, your work uh, sustainable long-term. Number four, care about the process more than the end. A lot of us have big dreams and big visions for the kinds of impact we wanna create, but if the journey to creating that impact is miserable, then you will be miserable and the whole process will be unsatisfying care about the process, the day-to-day, -day, the every little inch that you gain in your work, that's what matters. And number five, the last one, be open to new ways of working and thinking. Sometimes it can be easy for us to get locked into, no, this is what we want to do. This is the only way to do it. And when we're introduced with a new way of thinking or working, then we kind of reject it out of hand. Nope, this is not the way we've done things. But especially with scaling solutions, and I hope this webinar has challenged you to think and work in new and different ways. And this year we are revitalizing the Scaling Solutions program. We are, uh, we're not putting a reset, but we're giving it a new, uh, new coat of paint. Uh, and so we're focusing in on this issue of replication. So how can we take an initiative from country A, region A, and build it out into country B or region B? We are also focused in, in a really big way on tailored mentorship and training support. That means you're not going to get some generic mentor who just can advise you on basically everything. You're going to get the kind of mentorship that's exactly 
critical for the exact stage of your business for exactly what you need. And we're going to give you personal advisors and support so that, again, it's not just one size fits all, it's one size fits one. And in prior to Zero Conference uh, 2025, the Zero Project Conference in 2025 next year, we're going to give you in-depth pitch training by me on how to turn your enterprise into a story, how to use humor to engage your audience, and how to showcase the value of your company so that funders and investors will want to throw money at you because they will be ready to support you. And then, of course, in ZeroCon 2025, there will be matchmaking and new partnership opportunities. This last year was absolutely incredible. Seeing the 12 Scaling Solutions Fellows there at Zero Project uh, Conference 2024 was phenomenal, blew my mind. And seeing the growth that they have achieved in the short time we've gotten to work together has also been soul satisfying for me. So I hope that next year I see a lot of you who are here attending this webinar in the Zero Project Scaling Solutions 2025 cohort. With that, I'm going to ask everyone if you could please toss into the chat or toss into the poll. Regant is going to launch a poll here. We need your reflections. I, I'm interested to hear from you. Did this webinar help you at all? Does it work for your needs? Does this topic work for your needs? Does this topic fit with your priorities, your strategic priorities as a social enterprise? Is it relevant from your for your work? So if you could just check there, the, we've already launched the poll. I see that a lot of you have already been responding. If you could just check that poll real quick and respond to those few questions while I take a sip of tea. It would be great to get your insights here. Anything that you have here about whether or not this works for your needs, whether or not it fits with your organization's priorities, and whether or not it's relevant for your work, that would be really, really helpful. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for responding. For the few of you who have yet to respond, please jump in with your responses as well while we finish out here. Um, I want to leave you guys with a little bit to reflect on here because businesses who think they want to grow sometimes are thinking about it too early. And so I want to ask you, is it too early for you to start thinking about scaling? If you try to scale too quickly uh, without enough resources, planning, or really just strategic thinking about your products, about your services, about your initiatives, it can really, it can be challenging. It can be really problematic. So I want you to take this away as your, uh, as your reflection activity. Is it too early for you to be thinking about these issues? We have a call for nominations for Zero Conference 2025 that has already been out. Please take a look at this QR code. You can scan it now. The whole topic of uh, Zero Con 2025 is on inclusive employment and ICT. So if you do anything around inclusive employment and ICT, I would encourage you. I would be thrilled if you would nominate your initiative or someone that you know initiative to be part of Zero Conference 2025. It's an absolutely amazing experience. And we have Zero Project Latin America Conference that's coming up on May 7th. I'm going to be there. It's going to be awesome. It's at the Hotel W in Santiago de Chile. Uh, it's a regional conference on inclusive education, ICTs, and corporate strategies for inclusion. It's going to be in English and Spanish and international sign language and live captioned in Spanish. Please do check it out. It's going to be an absolutely phenomenal event. I'm very, very excited. I can't wait to get on the plane and get over there and see what kind of amazing things we can do together. And please do connect with me if you're interested in this kind of work, if you want to ask me questions, if you have any comments or concerns, or you just want to say, hey, Anthony, good job. I love what you're doing. Scan that QR code and connect with me on any social media that you might be interested in connecting, me, uh, connecting with me on, and we can continue this conversation. This webinar has been brought to you by a whole group of partners, but most especially by my company, Inclusive Creation. And you can get in touch with us at our website, uh, through my email, LinkedIn, Facebook, and at inclusivecreation.com on Instagram.
Thank you so much for taking the time to join with us. I really, really appreciate it. You guys are amazing. Again, uh, your attention and engagement in this is probably the most important gift you can give me and us and our work because it's one of the most scarce resources that you have. Thank you again to everyone here. Thank you to our uh, sign language interpreters. Thank you to our captioners. Thank you to our Spanish language interpreters. You guys are amazing. Thank you to the Essel Foundation, Fundacion de Scuberme, ATOS, GIZ, and BMZ, and most definitely the team at Inclusive Creation. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, and we will see each other hopefully for webinar number three coming up on April 9th. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.